All right, thank you, Michael, and thank you guys again for having me here. I can't remember, we were trying to figure out when the last time I was here was, but probably at least a year ago. So anyway, um, as Michael said, we're gonna go over um, the Ursa Mini Pro, but I'm actually gonna start with, um, with the panels first. So we'll kind of split this in half, go through a little bit, and, uh, and by the end, hopefully, um, once I've demoed some stuff on Resolve, using the panels, we'll also look at some of the Ursa Mini Pro footage in Resolve, uh, so you'll get a little bit of a taste of both uh, throughout the course of, of the presentation. Um, so, yeah, I just did let you guys know, I saw a show of hands before, it, sounds, it seems like a lot of you guys are kind of in my boat. Um, you're shooting and editing. Uh, you're probably, you know, we probably have some filmmakers in the audience all around. And one of the reasons I, I really love Blackmagic products, as I'm sure you guys do, is uh, they're really built for the filmmaker in mind. And I think in particular, it's kind of uh, fitting that we, we did the panels with the Ursa Mini Pro as one thing, because I think a lot of us are using these, these uh, products in tandem. So anyway, I want to just jump in. Um, I know a lot of you guys probably know uh, this already, so I'm gonna keep it quick, but I just wanna look at where these two panels fit into the lineup. So obviously the advanced panel here, uh, that was the original, uh, that's kinda still the, um, the most robust panel, that's what you're gonna see in uh, big post facilities and anyone that can afford a, a $30,000 panel. Um, and it's, it's incredible, but obviously what Blackmagic have done is really put this DNA um, into these two new panels. So um, what I think, again, advanced panel, I think it's really ideal for larger facilities. Um, uh, the mini panel, I think, takes so much of what the advanced panel does and puts it into a smaller size. So uh, I'm not gonna go over every single detail of what's in there and what's not, just because we, we don't have the time. There's a zillion features. Um, but I can tell you that uh, it's pretty incredible how much of the same uh, functionality is built into this mini panel. Uh, and the micro essentially is the mini panel without the top, uh, that the slanted kind of top that has the dual five inch monitors and uh, some additional knobs and hotkeys. Um, so they all serve their own purpose. Um, I love the mini, I love them both. I think the, the mini panel is really ideal for uh, someone like myself that does a lot of color grading, but I'm not a post facility per se, uh, but I do enough that I, I do benefit from the extra features. And I think the micro is great for someone that does uh, um, grading from time to time, but they're not maybe every single day, they're, they're not necessarily grading feature films and they want something a little more portable. It's also good for DIT work. Um, so just some of the similarities between the two of them, portability, uh, even this one, I brought this from home today. Uh, it's not the most portable thing in the world, but it's way more portable than, than obviously the larger advanced panel. Um, I think both of these you're gonna start seeing on set for dailies processing and, and just general DIT work. Um, the build quality and design of both of these across the board is just, it's so impressive. That was the first thing, um, it may sound kind of like a superficial thing, but when I first opened the, the box, I couldn't get over um, how, how good it looked. Uh, I've had clients come into my uh, edit suite and just kind of marvel over what this thing looks like. And that counts for something because at the end of the day, you know, when I look at Blackmagic Design and they have design in their name, and I think, you know, when you see that level of attention to detail, not just to the, the physical looks, but, you know, you kind of get a sense that that transcends what they're doing um, with the, the functionality and the integration with the software. So anyway, it's, uh, it's a nice first impression. It's kind of an added benefit. Um, that obviously translates to the trackballs and wheels, which are the lifeblood of any panel. And uh, as you'll see uh, in a little bit, I'm gonna do a demo for you guys. We'll uh, open up DaVinci, we'll start um, messing around with the panel here. You guys can take a look at, at what, um, what it can really do on some, uh, some actual footage. Um, and, uh, and you'll see how much uh, of a kind of granular fine detail is possible with these, uh, these trackballs here. Um, same with the shortcuts and buttons. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but I will touch on some of them over the course of the presentation. And uh, overall, I mean, the, big, the one big point I wanna make um, just before we get too deep into it and I forget is the biggest thing that I find from using this, I don't know how many of you guys already are using a panel or have used a panel, but it really cuts down your color grading time 
immensely, uh, especially once you get the hang of it and you start really using it and not being so reliant on your keyboard or on a mouse or on uh, you know, maybe a pen and tablet. Um, it's, uh, I, I find, I mean, if you're doing a 30 second commercial with six shots, there's only so much time to save. But when you're doing a 90 minute feature film, a 120 minute feature film, or even a series where you have to move really quickly, um, it, uh, every second really counts. And if you can shave five seconds, 20 seconds off of each shot, um, which it will do, if not more, um, then uh, you're really in a good position to, to get your work done in a much smaller amount of time. Um, and that also leads to improved efficiency. So it's not just getting done quicker, but getting done better. You're gonna, um, at least from my experience, um, I've been using a pen and tablet for years. I never really wanted to invest in um, any sort of panel, uh, to be honest, just because unless I was getting the best of the best, um, I, I didn't really, I've used some of the more budget conscious ones and it always kind of felt like a compromise. So for me, I was always happy just using a really high-end sort of Wacom tablet. Um, and uh, moving from that to this system um, has, has really not only allowed me to work quicker, um, but genuinely get better results uh, because I'm getting a, a level of detail that um, never really existed before. So um, anyway, moving on, I, I want to kind of keep this, some of this somewhat quick uh, so we can actually jump into Resolve. Um, but full screen color grading. So this is something um, all, most of us who are working professionally and our main focus is color grading have a dedicated monitor. We have a broadcast monitor. I know I have one at home. Um, however, you're not always necessarily going to have access to that. Maybe you're doing some on-set grading, maybe you're traveling, um, whatever it may be, um, and you need to have some sort of more portable version, or maybe you're just working um, on your main system and you're doing some, some light passes. A million reasons why you're not using your main broadcast monitor, um, one of which is today demoing something for you guys. I'm able to actually enter a full screen mode and control and manipulate the colors um, without having to go back and forth. So typically, obviously, you're gonna enlarge your image or uh, reduce it, color it when you're in the window, enlarge it, see what it looks like, go back and forth. You can waste a lot of time doing that. And you also miss opportunities to really find like this, this sweet spot in your image. Um, so I think that's a big sort of really broad general thing, but it's something that um, on sort of a fundamental level has really uh, changed how, how I work, at least when I'm not on my, my full system. Um, so there's obviously a lot of keys, uh, and these differ between the two panels. Um, we have different keys for uh, navigating through different shots. So you have your next clip, previous clip, next frame. Uh, you can pull up stills, grab stills. You could do a lot of your uh, basic functionality that you typically be doing with a mouse or um, whatever else you're using, uh, you can now do that on the panel. Um, and there's more of that, we'll touch on in a second, but there's more of that on the mini than the micro. Um, but I would say, uh, for me personally, probably 80% of what I need to do day-to-day color-wise um, I can do even on the micro panel. Um, it, it, there's obviously going to be certain things, drawing power windows or masks and certain things that you need to get in there for. Um, and some of those things even apply to the mini panel. But um, the bottom line is uh, you can do a lot on this little thing. So it's, it's really powerful. Um, uh, some of my favorite things, and we'll get into this during the demo, uh, contrast, saturation, hue, they all have their individual knobs. Uh, there's Y lift gamma, there's uh, highlight and shadow knobs that are just specifically dedicated to those functions. Um, so you get a lot of functionality um, that typically, even though it's available uh, in Resolve, I find personally I'm not always accessing these features because they're not at my fingertips, they're not as um, intuitive to use. So when I'm here and I'm looking down and it's kind of almost like a visual workflow in front of me, there's my contrast, my pivot, my detail, all the things that whether or not I need to use them and in what order, um, they're at least presented in front of me, they're easy to access. I find I'm actually using uh, a lot more of these tools. So pivot and mid detail, I mentioned, I'm gonna demo that for you guys in a little bit. And um, on the mini panel, these are a couple of the little differences we'll touch on uh, just before we move on here. But 
on the mini panel, you get access to um, basically all the usual interface panels. So whether you're doing your raw control or your windows or your qualifier, um, all of those different tabs and, and uh, sub windows or interface panels, whatever you want to call them, uh, you can access them just by hitting these, these keys up here. So we're actually today, we're going to be demoing on the micro, not the mini. Um, but, uh, but afterward, you guys will have a chance to come up, take a look at uh, the panel. If you guys have questions, happy to answer any of that. But this will, you know, I'll show you guys after some similar stuff on here, but just know this will um, adjust that as well as, um, I'm going to skip by this for now, the adaptable five inch displays. So people often ask me, what are these actually for? Uh, depending on what mode you're in, these are going to adapt and give you different controls, different settings. Uh, so you can continue to sort of uh, customize whatever it is you're doing. If you have a window up, you'll have controls for that. Um, if you have uh, your raw controls, you're going to have all of these knobs essentially adjust to different settings along the way. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and it, it, for that reason, again, I think you get a lot of that functionality of the bigger panel. Um, so let's see. So I want to jump into a little bit of... Uh, a demo here, and I'm going to pull up some shots. These are just all kind of a mixture. I wanted to uh, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a taste of uh, some different types of footage. So we have a few shots here, shot on uh, the Alexa. We have something shot on one of my DSLRs, something on, from the Ursa Mini Pro, and um, there's kind of a different function that I want to show you with each shot. So. The first one here is what I talked about before. It's the full screen mode. So typically, I'm on a laptop. This is my only screen. If I were to kind of operate this as I normally would, if I'm grading somewhere, I shouldn't be like on an airplane or something like that. I'd be you know, pulling this down and then looking up at the adjustment. No, that went too far. Um, you know, I'm sliding things around somewhat haphazardly. And then I might go into full screen to really take a look at what it's doing. And uh, you have to do that, because at the end of the day, sometimes you're making adjustments. For example, you make an adjustment to the shadows, and it looks great when it's, it's small. But then you go into full screen, and you realize it brought up some noise, or there's some artifacts you didn't, you didn't notice before, whatever it may be. Um, so in, on the panel, first of all, you have your own uh, hotkey shortcut button for it says viewer, which basically gives you a full screen. I'm just going to reset this. But the nice thing is, while you're grading, you never have to take your eyes off of the screen. So right now, I'm just I'm looking at this screen. I'm not going to do a perfect grade, but just to give you guys an example. Once in a while, I'm going to look down just to see, reorient myself. I'm sure after another couple months, I'll probably know this by heart. But um, but yeah, I mean, whether I'm, I'm warming it up a little and I want to cool down the shadows, warming up the highlights, it looks a little green, I'm going to push it down to purple. It's a really intuitive way to work. Um, and I find uh, th this, um, I'm not even sure how to really say this without you trying it yourself, but it kind of connects you to the software in a, in a way where you know which way, after you do it for, you know, you spend an hour doing this, you know in, inherently, even if you're not a colorist that spends hours every day doing this, you know which way is warm and which way is cool, and if it's a little too purple, how you can tint to green and so forth. Um, it just, it's so intuitive to, to use that way. Um, and like I said, if you want to uh, snap back in or out, you can do so um, just using the hotkeys right on here. So that is a simple but extremely powerful feature. Um, and by the way, before we move on from even this shot, let me reset this. Um, so let's say uh, I were to try to do that on here. The other issue is not only do I have to keep looking down all the time, but when I start throwing things around with my mouse, or in this case with the, with the trackpad on, on my laptop, you're going to pull, it takes a lot, it takes very little effort to go from here to here. I mean, that's, that's a quarter of an inch moving my finger, and you're, you're getting that blue in the shadows. Um, on the other hand, you could be on here, and to get that blue, I have to really work to get to that same point. Um, so you're less likely to pull your colors in the wrong direction. Um, and that really especially matters when you're doing more complex grades. 
uh, things that are um, a little bit more uh, complicated and even doubly true when you're doing that on compressed footage. If you're working with DSLR footage, slow motion footage where you're, you know, your bit rate is stretched pretty thin, uh, you're going to have, you're going to run into some trouble when you start pushing and pulling and trying to do some crazy bleach bypass look. Um, and, uh, and your codec just can't really support that. So this allows you uh, really to push your colors around less and get the same or better results. <clears throat> so anyway, let's move on. Let's take a look at another shot here. Um, let's see. On this one, I want to show you guys the uh, kind of my basic, how I usually start grading a shot, which is contrast, saturation, and pivot. So everyone works differently. Um, when I start grading a shot, um, this is something, again, we shot for commercial recently. I directed on uh, Alexa, and um, it was uh, kind of a run and gun shoot. It was unlit, it's kind of flat, so I'd have to do a lot of work above and beyond just what I'm gonna show you guys here. Um, but the first thing I'm gonna do, um, I don't personally like applying a translation LUT. I, I just, uh, the Alexa Rec 709 is, is great, but I, that's just not how I like to work myself. Um, so I'm going to just turn up the contrast, uh, bring up the lift a little bit here, dial in the saturation, and uh, make some minor adjustments. So in, you know, five seconds, I basically, let me use this here, force of habit on my laptop. I'm almost not even using it. So in five seconds, we have a graded image. Um, so again, it's not my final image, but in one node and with minimal correction, it's looking pretty good. If I wasn't using the panel, I'd probably be tempted to uh, do these on separate nodes. And just in case I made a mistake, I could just delete one node and go back kind of incrementally. Uh, I don't have to do that on this. I can kind of keep everything, all the basics, all my primary corrections on a single node, which is really great. Uh, the other thing I want to show you guys, let me uh, start this from scratch again. So uh, the pivot knob, and there are, there's a better shot later to demonstrate this on, but, um, but I'll show you a little bit here. The pivot knob, um, the best way I can describe it, um, and I think this is technically accurate, is it will it will essentially move the center point of where your contrast is. So if you're adding a ton of contrast, I'll put way too much here just to demonstrate it, and then you can pivot where that contrast is going to land. So maybe we want some contrast kind of in her face, um, and the shadows are kind of clipping to black, but we can always lift that up. Um, so that's something that comes in handy a lot, and I'll show you guys in a little bit on a specific shot where where and when that is really going to help you. Um, oftentimes it's for daytime exteriors, when you're dealing with sky, when you're dealing with a lot of detail in the highlights, um, amongst other things. So I'll show you guys that in a second. Um, let me step back here. We're going to go to our third shot. Um, so I kind of showed you guys this before, but let me just um, do this again just to kind of drive the point home. This is, this is a tricky shot to grade uh, because it's very hazy. We had the sun coming in, obviously, on the right side of the frame here. Uh, too much smoke machine going on uh, for, <laughs> for <laughs> anyone's taste. And, uh, and we, um, if for that reason, I'm tempted to add a lot of contrast, obviously. So right now I'm dialing up the contrast knob, making her fall into silhouette. So I'm going to lift it up. Could keep pushing and pulling this and eventually get somewhere decent. Uh, by the way, right now I'm going to use the color boost, which uh, essentially adds saturation to the less saturated areas of the image. So you're not Let's say your highlights are on, not very saturated, but your shadows are. You're not oversaturating one area over the other. Anyway, so I'm doing a little bit of that. Um, and sometimes on a shot like this, where everything kind of blends together, what I'll actually do is I will intentionally oversaturate the image. Um, and I do that just to be abundantly clear about where the fall off is, where there's too much green, where there's too much purple, et cetera. So I'm going to do that right now. So I see that there's a ton of green and kind of the highlights and, and some of the higher midtones. Um, and normally, again, if I was doing this just with a mouse, I'd probably start pushing things down a little bit here. And then by the time I push this into more purple territory, the shadows now are way too blue for my taste. So I'm just going to undo a couple of those. Uh, corrections. 
Um, and instead, let me turn the saturation back up. Instead, what I'll do is utilize one of the other really powerful benefits of a control panel, especially one with the responsiveness of the micro panel, uh, which is doing two things at once. As I'm cooling down those mids, I'm gonna warm up the shadows. So it's gonna take a little second to get right, but there we go. So now we have a pretty balanced image. It's not perfect. This is for the sake of the demo. Not gonna spend another three minutes getting the shot perfect. Um, but again, it's pretty cool that we went from this to this um, by being able to just move those knobs around simultaneously. Um, I don't even know if I had more time, if I'd be able to, to get this exact type of result um, without using these kind of, uh, these trackballs. So um, another good thing, again, a lot of this stuff you guys are gonna see for yourself when you actually use the panels, but I can tell you it's, it's definitely been a lifesaver for me. Um, moving on, so next shot, um, this is, this is a good shot just to show you guys because this is DSLR footage. Um, this is something I, I, a test shot I took recently. I, I picked up a little Fuji X-T2 mirrorless camera, which is a cool little camera. Shot this in HD 60p, slowed it down. So that camera is very cool, but one of the issues with it is it doesn't have, um, uh, it, it has a very low bit rate codec relative to what Blackmagic is gonna give you uh, or whatever. So you're gonna get, um, I actually don't even remember in, in 60p, I know in 4K you get 100 megabit, which, which isn't a lot, especially over, even if it's that in 60, then when you spread, when you go into slow motion, that less than halves it. So that's more like 40, uh, 40 megabit. So anyway, the point is, this is not an image that you can push around a lot. Um, however, it's an image that I would kind of have to because, uh, again, unlike Blackmagic cameras, this does not have 15 stops of dynamic range, so I have to underexpose a little bit to protect the highlights, um, which means if I wanna bring the highlights back up, I have to be really careful um, that I don't start introducing too much noise. And when I am doing it this way, um, that's not the, the best way to do it because I'm probably sometimes going a little bit past where I need to go. Um, so instead, again, I would go back to the panel, typically play this through. By the way, it's another nice feature, hopefully. Um, I haven't done this on my laptop, but yeah, it looks like it's working fine on here too. You can grade as it's playing in real time. Um, so I'm, again, I'm doing a really extreme look here. Um, and we can pull it back. but. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome to be able to have that control um, over the shot. And this isn't something you're gonna see the image fall apart on because I didn't completely destroy this while I was shooting it, but there are scenarios where I've made the mistake and I was trying to push it to that point before um, and it'll get there, but there's points where you're gonna crush it so much and then you're gonna try to lift up the shadows and it's gonna get noisy. Um, but again, there's no need to do that when you never have to get to that point with the panel. So um, that I think we've hopefully made clear by now. And, uh, and this is really, I think this shot in particular is one of the ones that I really wanted to um, share with you guys because this is where that pivot knob really comes into play. Um, so taking a shot like this, this is a, a little music video we directed. Uh, well, we shot this actually on the um, on the Ursa Mini Pro as well. This is the first, uh, first footage from this that, that was on the Ursa Mini Pro, just in case anyone's interested. Um, and, uh, and this was shot, I think, at something like 120 frames per second. It was the max uh, in HD. So this uh, obviously is not representing the absolute best quality that the camera has to offer. Um, but I did want to use this as an example because even in that highly compressed state that the footage is in, uh, there is still a lot that you can do to the image. Um, in this case, bringing back the sky detail. Uh, if any of you guys ever visit my blog, I actually did an article w using this shot as a demo a couple of days ago, maybe last week, um, on retaining sky detail. And for me, the pivot is really kind of the key in, in doing that. So anyway, I'm adding a little contrast here. So, you know, we're getting it to look a little more interesting, but, uh, and let me pull, pull up some saturation too, just a touch. Um, but obviously we're kind of losing that uh, sky detail. Um, there's 
it's there. It doesn't look like it's there initially, but there actually is plenty of detail in that sky. Uh, we lose it when we add contrast. So now I'm going to turn the pivot down. So we're going to actually place that contrast in the sky. She's going to go into a little bit more of a silhouette. Um, and then we can, I'm going to make this somewhat extreme. Um, and then we'll, we'll bring her back in a second. Um, so I'm going to basically uh, kind of ride that line of trying to get it almost to clip in the highlights with a lot of contrast, uh, but not quite too much. And then the other thing with Sky on a side note, and again, this is something I mentioned in my article, if any of you have read it, um, but when you add um, any sort of color to a sky like this, the detail really starts to pop because you see the difference. So if I start warming it up and then pulling down the, um, the mids a little, warming up the highlights, you could kind of go anywhere and it's going to look nice with a shot like this. Uh, but, uh, but you start to see more of that detail. Obviously, now she is in silhouette. Um, and one of the really cool things with this panel, and again, another feature that I, I'm constantly using, is the highlight and, sa uh, highlight and shadow uh, control knobs here. So typically, you might be tempted just to take, and let me balance this a little bit better first. I'm just going to kind of get her skin tones looking a little more normal. So let's, um, if we were to just take our lift and just turn it up, then she's going to brighten up, but so is the sky. So we, again, we kind of go back closer to almost where our starting place was. But if we take this back down, and instead of adjusting the lift, we adjust only the shadows uh, with the knob that we have here. So now I'm just lifting her up, and the sky is essentially staying the same. So it's, it gives you a, a degree of control, again, that you just you could get in the interface, but when it's right here, you're going to use that stuff more often. So um, again, just to show you, um, so this is the, if I reset this to nothing, that's kind of where we were at. So there's, there's quite a bit of a difference. We're seeing a lot more detail in the sky. And by the way, on, on one last kind of side note before we go to the next shot, um, this is a perfect example of why you're going to get better results with the control surface. If you look at how, you guys can't see how minuscule the movements are that I'm doing with my hand here, but if I move from, this is half an inch of movement from here to here on the, on the highlights, and that's a completely different image, maybe an inch of mov movement from here to here. If you were to move physically, and you do have to think of it that way because we're still human beings operating these machines, if you were to physically move even a quarter of an inch on here, you're going to go like this. So you, there are certain shots where you have a much more kind of sensitive palette to work with, um, and you're going to get way better results, uh, at least in my opinion, or at least from my experience, I should say, um, when you're using something like this. So. Uh, last shot I'm going to show you here, and then we're going to move on to some camera stuff. Uh, this is uh, a little shot from the Ursa Mini Pro as well, obviously ungraded. So again, I'll walk through my typical thing, just turning the contrast knob up. I'm just going to pull the, this into the mids into a little bit more of a cooler territory, warm up the, uh, the highlights a bit. So again, so we have our basic, uh, we have our basic grade there. Um, but the, the really cool thing here is there's a, a feature called mid detail. Uh, it's available, by the way, if you're not using the panel, it's just down here. Um, it's on MD, so right now you can crank it up or down just with your, your mouse over here. Um, but the, what it does, and I'm going to turn it the wrong way for this shot first, it essentially adjusts only the mid-tones, the detail in the mid-tones, not the shadows or the highlights, um, which is helpful for a couple of reasons. There's situations where you're going to want to have a landscape shot and you want to bring, there's no people in it, you want the clouds to pop, you want um, as much detail as possible. So you have kind of like a, you know, a wow factor before it gets uh, too much because there is a threshold to that. I'm going to show you obviously on a face you don't do that because we turn it up too much and it starts to get, as you can probably see, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this on a separate node so I can just toggle that on and off um, itself. So we'll just kind of go back here. Let's say this is our, our base grade. We're going to add another uh, serial node. By the way, on the mini panel, you can do that right from the top here, but uh, 
I don't believe I have that ability on the micro. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm turning up the mid detail. I'm going to go all the way, way further than you would ever go, especially on a face. And now we can just uh, toggle this on and off. So you can see, um, and let's see how well it's reading. So yeah, you guys can see what it's doing. It's basically accentuating every single um, uh, pore and everything that you normally would not want to uh, do on a human face. You could take it, though, the other way, and you can crank it down, which is typically how it's used. And I'm going to take it way further than you ever should, just to give you guys a, a point. So, <laughs> so then you start getting something that looks like this. Um, and after a second, it almost starts looking, you almost get desensitized to it. But then you turn it on and off, and you realize what it actually looks like. So typically on something like this, maybe you go somewhere in the middle. Maybe you soften it up 20%, 30%. And then it's going to affect other areas, the lips, the eyes, that you don't want it to affect. So you might do some little masks or windows to isolate it, um, make sure it doesn't affect the stuff you don't want it to affect. Um, but again, that's just one more uh, feature, another case in point of something I typically almost never used, even though it was right there under the hood the whole time, and I have it right here. So if I'm sitting with a client, um, there was a music video recently I colored, um, and I did not shoot this one. It was uh, a, a job for a colleague of mine. And uh, there had to be a lot of beauty work done, as opposed to sending it to After Effects or even Fusion or anything like that. Um, we did everything basically with a combination of mid detail and some tracking with some masks. So really, really cool, powerful feature. And uh, and yeah, I, I definitely recommend uh, trying it both on people and even landscape. So let's do um, a quick, quick wrap up here. Um, and then I'm going to get into the camera stuff. So some key takeaways. Intuitive, even if you've never colored, try it, because I think you're going to find it really easy to use. Way more control than a mouse. Uh, better results in less time. Minimal adjustment with compressed footage, which is huge for me, because I'm always working with uh, DSLR stuff. And I think for freelancers or small post houses, uh, this is amazing. Um, it's uh, You're going to see it at big post houses, too, I'm sure, in some of their smaller suites. but. Uh, to be able to have the feel of a large post house in your basement or in your two to three person shop uh, is is pretty remarkable. So um, hopefully you guys took something from that. Let's uh, jump in here because we don't have a ton of time left. Um, let's look at some uh, some Ursa Mini Pro. So this is one. This is actually a picture from NAB, um, but because I didn't have any good ones of of mine my own on set, but. Uh, but that's what they look like. I'm sure you guys know by now. Um, I, say, I say here it's a perfect companion to Resolve because it really is. If you're shooting, especially if you're shooting raw, cinema, DNG, uh, you're going to have a much easier time editing that natively. In some cases, it's the only option you really have um, to edit that natively right inside of DaVinci, whether you want to generate proxies or not, depending on how fast your system is pretty incredible to have that ability. Um, so uh, same image quality as the 4.6K. Most of the footage I'll show you guys in a little bit is actually from the Pro. Um, but I recently directed a feature film using the uh, original Ursa Mini. And, uh, and I wanted to show you guys a little bit of that footage, too, because it's a little more polished. It's a little more finished. Um, and it's virtually identical. You can shoot them side by side. Um, and, uh, and you're basically going to get, get the same image. Um, the benefit, though, of the Pro is the usability. So uh, obviously, just by looking at it, if you've ever seen the regular Ursa Mini, uh, you know that uh, it doesn't have the same amount of physical control on the body. You have, uh, for one, minor things that seem minor but make a huge difference when you're on a gimbal, an on-off switch that is not behind the monitor, that's going to allow you to operate that way more freely when you're on a gimbal. Um, you have white balance controls. You have your audio controls. It, pretty much every major function that you need is right there. So again, that's, that's a huge, huge improvement. Um, for me, the biggest thing are the ND filters. Um, and not just because there are ND filters, but more importantly, because they have such an incredible IR filtration. So anyone that's ever shot on uh, 
uh, other uh, black magic cameras or red cameras or really many high-end cinema cameras um, that are, are always gonna have to battle infrared pollution just because of the nature of how cinema cameras typically work. Um, you know that that's a serious thing and oftentimes people do extensive camera tests to figure out which uh, combination of which IR filters are going to work best with their sensor. And uh, with this camera, you, you don't have to do that. It's built in, you have, um, I believe, up to six stops. Uh, so there's three different levels of ND. And, uh, and it's pretty remarkable. I can tell you, we used on our feature, we used IRND filters from Schneider. Uh, great filters, they're something like four or five hundred dollars each filter, they're, they're phenomenal IR&D filters, but when you use them, uh, they're, they're not customized to a specific camera, so uh, if you use too many of them, if you stack too many of them, you start getting tints to magenta in the shadows and so forth, you do not get that, you basically get the same image whether you're clean or you have three stops or six stops of uh, filtration in front of your sensor. I think it's great for run and gun. Um, our feature, uh, again, it was, uh, this would be, uh, excuse me, let me get back here. So this would be even better for uh, what we shot, but even the original, um, even the original Ursa Mini was fantastic for, for run and gun just because you can literally leave it built. We had our uh, Blackmagic uh, EVF on top. We just pulled it out of the case, started shooting. Um, and this makes it even easier with all of the, the physical controls. That also makes it more versatile, and, uh, and that's that. So let's take a look at a little bit of sample footage. Um, the first thing I'm gonna show you guys here is, where's my desktop? This is some uh, footage from our teaser. So I'm just gonna play it through. This is the, the feature I shot. It's only 60 second teaser just with some shots. So I'm just gonna talk you guys through some of it. Um, basically, everything you're seeing here is lit with either natural light or, at the most, a single light panel. Uh, so w between the fact that you get your 15 stops of dynamic range and you're still retaining this kind of level of detail in the shadows and the highlights, um, that's phenomenal. But a lot of people often ask, how is it going to do in low light situations? We had many night shoots. We shot an entire scene that was only lit by a campfire and uh, we were on a T2.0 lens. It wasn't even an exorbitantly fast lens, and, uh, and it, looked, it looked great. Um, so again, it's not, um, it's not gonna do what a FS7 will do, but it's gonna, in my opinion, look a lot better than a camera that you're gonna uh, bump the ISO way up on, use no lights, and then everything's gonna be really flat. Shot like this, we're shooting directly into the sun and we're still maintaining so much detail. So that's just a little taste. Um, there's plenty of other screen grabs and footage and stuff like that on my blog. If you guys want to take a look, I'll pull up the, the address after for any of you guys that um, haven't, haven't seen it before. It's noamcroll.com. Um, and then let's take a look at a little more footage. So here, this is just some random test footage. This is basically ungraded footage. This is now with the Pro. Um, so you can see it still has such an incredible level of detail that it captures. I actually took a picture um, with a stills camera in RAW on the, the Fuji stills camera that I just bought. And there's so much more detail, even in ProRes, in the, in the water here, you know, different levels of, there's so much more color depth. You see so many different textures of blue that you don't see otherwise. So, I was so impressed with that. And then more so impressed, I'm gonna show you guys some stuff here. It's a little short film I, I shot recently for fun. Um, I might try to release it sometime in the next few weeks. Uh, this is just some footage, again, we took with the Ursa Mini Pro. This is what I really wanna show you guys. This was a total experiment for me. Um, it looks like this for a reason, and I'll show you guys why. But um, I was in a bit of a tricky situation. I, ha I shot, literally made this film to test the camera, did it by myself, no crew, no audio even. I was doing everything myself. And um, in this situation, the only lighting I had was tungsten. So obviously we're shooting against daylight. 
I wasn't going to put a tungsten light in there or, you know, her face would, would go super orange. So we decided, uh, I decided, I guess, to, to forego that and see what this camera is really made of and uh, expose for the highlights, let her fall into silhouette and just trust that this thing really does have 15 stops of dynamic range. Let's see what it can do. So uh, I did it, took a bit of a risk, and this is not the final grade that you're going to see in the next shot, but you could see how much detail was actually pulled back. That's a really rough, quick and dirty version um, that I literally did in 30 seconds. Um, and all that is is essentially a power window on her that I can show you guys um, that just, it's just a single, uh, a single window that, let me get here that is just doing this. So it's just bringing her up. There's so much detail in the shadows. Um, and obviously, if I were gonna finalize this, I'd refine it more. I'd probably actually draw a mask around her and track it. This is just a circular window, just to make sure the detail is there. Um, but that's, uh, I think, kind of goes to show what it's capable of. Um, so here, we're gonna play through uh, I don't know at all, especially with the lights on in here, how much of this stuff will read, but I wanted to experiment how much I can get away with shooting in ultra low light. So I turned off every single light in this house. This is during blue hours, so there's a little bit of light just pouring in from the windows past sunset. So sun was gone already for half an hour. Um, and on this, so I'll bring it up just so you guys can see it a little bit better. On a proper monitor, you can see this no problem, but I'll crank this up a little a little higher. So there was so much detail, even at ISO 800, that the biggest kind of drawback for people is they always worry, well, am I going to be able to shoot in low light? Um, I'm going to bring this up again here. And absolutely. I mean, unless you need to shoot in no light, then personally, I, I have no problem shooting at 800, even at 1600 on this camera. Um, any noise that you get is very organic, very minimal. And um, all that stuff, except for this shot, um, was, uh, was in ProRes. Um, one of the nice things with this camera is I use a lot of LUTs. And again, you guys that have been on my site know that I, I make my own LUTs too. Um, and oftentimes I, I want to really, I shot like this, I shot in RAW because there was a sun, sun coming in the window. Um, I wanted to retain the highlight detail. I didn't know how much I was going to throw it around. And when I start looking at what I can do, I'm just gonna apply some pretty extreme LUTs for this scenario. These aren't necessarily extreme LUTs by any stretch, but for this scenario, I'll start with a more basic one. So this is, uh, this is a pretty basic LUT. So this is just what I call a blockbuster. It's just kind of lifting it up, giving it a little, little punch, warming up the shadows. So that's, that's pretty simple, um, but uh, on cooler shots, it can make a big difference. Um, However, if I were to add a LUT like this from my winter pack, which is it, normally, I mean, this is going to push it pretty far. I think, uh, which one can I show you? Probably number one. So this is going to take it to really blue, and I'll lift it up so you guys can see it a little better. If I were to do this on DSLR footage, and the point would probably be driven home a lot more if, if I had an exact shot from a DSLR, but you can't really do this unless you're shooting at a much cooler white balance without paying some sort of price in terms of noise, some artifacting, and that basically doesn't exist, um, whether you're in RAW or ProRes. RAW, obviously, you have some more advantages, but um, to me, there's no difference, and then I could flip back to um, anything else, just a classic kind of look. Um, so this is kind of more of a faded look, and you get, just so much flexibility with these images um, that you really don't get with other cameras, just to put it uh, mildly. So I think, again, going back to my point for run and gun shooters, if you're not using any light, um, sometimes I find no lights are better than having too few lights. If you have two lights, um, you're probably gonna end up with a flattish image if, you, if you're not careful with what you're doing. If you have no lights, if nothing else, you'll get a nice, cool, dramatic silhouette or something backlit.